This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. I'm really happy to be back with you to start the new year with a look at some of the most exciting human evolution discoveries of 2022. I'm here with Origin Stories producer, Ray Pang. Hey, Meredith. Hey, Ray. It's so great to be on the show again. It's so good to have you here. We interviewed four Leaky Foundation grantees who told us about the recent research that they found most fascinating. So, what's our first discovery? The first discovery I want to share comes from Carol Ward, who longtime listeners might remember was our first guest on our very first episode of Origin Stories. Carol's a paleoanthropologist who teaches anatomy at the University of Missouri. She's a Leakey Foundation science advisor, and she's also the winner of this year's Gordon P. Getty Award for Multidisciplinary Research. And she told me about a study on ape and human vocal anatomy that was published in the journal Science. I was really excited about this paper because it deals with one of the big questions in human evolution, which is the evolution of human speech, which goes along with language, of course. And it's been something that's been really intractable for a long time because most of the anatomy involved in speech, speech production and language in general is soft tissue which is invisible to us in the fossil record. So the authors of this study, Takeshi Nishimura and colleagues, tried to get at this big question about the evolution of human speech in a whole new way. And they found something surprising about how we're able to make sounds that are so different from other primates. They looked at the vocal anatomy of a wide range of primate species, from cotton-top tamarins and capuchin monkeys to gibbons, gorillas, and humans. When I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking in a very regular tone. We have very predictable, regular sounds that we use when we speak. No matter what those sounds are in your language, they're very predictable. When you hear a monkey or an ape, they tend to make a call, but it varies in frequency. It's much less regular and predictable and consistent. So I don't know how many monkey or ape sounds you've heard before, but I thought I might play you one. (laughs) Have you ever heard a gibbon? I don't think so. (laughs) Wow. It has like such a musical quality to it. Yeah, it sounds a lot better than a chimp. Here, I'll play you a a chimp sound just for fun. Kind of terrifying. That's their greeting. That's a pant hoot. Since Carol's an anatomy professor, and I'm definitely not, I asked her to walk us through what happens when humans make sounds. We have sort of paired cords in our voice box and our throat, which you can feel is the bump that sticks out the front of your neck. And we take our lungs and we push air up through the space between them. And then we have a whole complicated series of cartilages and muscles that move those vocal folds to make the hole between them a particular dimension, which creates a particular sound. And we know a lot about it in humans, but you can't very well put a scope down a chimpanzee's throat and have him make sounds. That's not going to work out for anybody. The researchers took MRIs of all these different kinds of primates, including some chimps that weren't alive, that had died natural deaths. And they noticed that we just have vocal folds, but all other primates have a membrane, which sort of is a flap of tissue that extends sort of up and towards the middle between them. And that wobbles around essentially when the air is pushed through and it doesn't allow a consistent sound. They did some really high-end mathematical modeling of, of airflow. And they concluded that in fact, the loss of these membranes next to the vocal folds have allowed humans to make this consistent speech sounds. And this might've been a key feature in human evolution. Isn't that cool? That's super cool. So does that change what we thought before or just give um, scientists a new way to look at it about the development of our ability to talk? 
Sure. It's it's definitely a new aspect of human speech and language that has been absolutely something we couldn't even get into before. And of course, we'll never be able to see this in fossils. So we can use um, what paleontologists call the extant phylogenetic bracket. That means you look at the closest living relatives of your favorite fossils, which is early hominins for us, and try to reconstruct what's happening. The membrane they found was entirely unexpected, and it really changes the way scientists thought speech might have evolved. And it's cool because it also represents a new wave of research looking at soft tissues and considering what we see in modern animals and then making inferences about fossils. It's not that paleontologists in the past didn't think about this, but they didn't really have the kind of tools that we have now for visualizing soft tissues, for um, conducting the kinds of studies that we can now, and we can start to get at questions that were invisible before. And this is a great example of that. And it looks at a soft tissue structure that we'll probably never see in the fossil record, but that is maybe really key to um, this source of communication that we have. It doesn't say what anyone would have said with these vocal folds, but the sort of obvious hypothesis is the vocal membranes were lost for a reason to create this anatomy that permits our language. Is this something that our last common ancestor with chimps would have had? So it's sort of most likely that the last common ancestor of chimps and humans would have had it. One that would have been lost, we don't really know. Whether Australopithecus could have made really loud pant hoot calls in the forests of Eastern Africa would have been super cool. Um, we just we don't know that yet, but it's really important to think about how these changes took place. What I think is great about this study and studies like it is just because we don't see it in the fossil record doesn't mean it wasn't really important for understanding human evolution. And we need to remind ourselves of that all the time. And we need to keep pushing and finding ways to use comparative studies to supplement the fossil record to get the picture straight. <laughs> wow. I was like completely taken by surprise by that discovery. That was not what I expected at all. <laughs> Yeah, for me, it was kind of surprising because I would have thought that we would have known that already. I guess it's just a matter of what tools we have to look at things. Like known the soft tissue differences between our vocal boxes and, and other like primates? Yeah, don't you think so? I guess I haven't thought about that. Is that something we should or should not have known? There's something that's so poetic in that, that we we actually had to lose something to gain the ability to speak. Yeah, that is super interesting way to think about it. So what's your first discovery that you brought? I'm excited to hear this because I have no idea. Okay, the first discovery that I'm bringing you is from Dr. Sophia Sampercaro. She's an archaeologist and a senior lecturer at the Australian National University at the School of Cultural History and Language. She studies like paleontology and zooarchaeology. Here she is. I love animals, but I didn't want to deal with a live one. Like I could, I didn't want to deal with, you know, suffering of animals and the blood and all those things. So I thought, well, maybe I could deal with the dead ones. So then I got into kind of paleontology, zoo archaeology. I was also really fascinated about um, human behavior and learning about, you know, early humans and past hominins and what were they doing, how they survive in the wild kind of thing. And so she brought us a story about a new fossil from a really familiar fossil site in Spain called Atapuerca. Okay. And I'm just going to I'm just going to play it. So this fossil was found in Atapuerca, that is World Heritage Site, one of the major sites, archaeological sites or paleoanthropological sites in Spain that has yield a lot of hominin fossils over the years. But this one is really exciting because it's 1.4 million years old. That is just crazy, right? Like that that they preserve and they can find it. And I just want to say that like, this is a really big deal for a number of reasons. One is that this fossil they found is 1.4 million years old. And it's been called the oldest hominin found in Europe. So that that on its own is like a new kind of flag bearer for humans moving out of Africa. And two, the fossils 
suggests that this hominin, which hasn't been identified, mm. has what she calls a modern face, which means that the face itself is like upright. It's vertical. As humans today, like our foreheads and our chins are, are pretty parallel, right? But we do have the little chin that sticks out. We have a little chin that sticks out. But when you think about like a gorilla or an ape or Neanderthals where they have big brows and, and their faces are much more horizontal, like they stick out. Yeah. Like a cartoon dog, right? <laughs> where like the nose sticks out and the mouth sticks out. Yeah, we have these little tiny flat faces. We have these tiny flat faces and they don't really protrude that far. And 1.4 million years old is a lot older than the earliest Homo sapiens. It's earlier than Neanderthals, and it's earlier than Denisovans. Okay, tell me. I want to know more. They look much more like modern humans than other previous hominins, other previous past humans, like you know, Homo erectus or all these other hominins. So what did they actually find? Like, did they find a whole skull or fragments? Some years ago, they did found a bit of the jaw. But again, it was just a bit, a small bit of it, a small fragment of it. And these new fossils, they come from below where the jaw was found. So the jaw, they dated to 1.2 million. And that's why they know this one is older because it appeared lower, but it might be related somehow to that jaw. And these new fossils, what is called the maxilla, so the left bone part of your like upper teeth, and also like the bone next to your left eye. That's just the bit they found. But because they found mm -hmm. that bit, they can they can see the um, that vertical face. It's like it's a tiny bone. It would be probably not more than eight, ten centimeters, but it is a quite characteristic bit of the face to be able to say which species they might be related to. So I found it really exciting because in paleoanthropology or archaeology, we are always looking for that missing link, right? And I, I find really exciting how and really interesting how, you know, by looking at the bones, you can sometimes find hybrids, if you want to call, like some characteristics that are more similar to modern humans and some of them that are more archaic, you want to say. With this one, what it seems is it looks a lot like modern humans. So wh what are we looking at? So it moves the timeline back in a way of maybe when we started to develop these traits that previously weren't thought to have shown up in our genetic lines for like hundreds of thousands or maybe even like a million years. We talked a little bit about the fact that this fossil, it predates modern humans, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and that this site is like a gold mine. Oh yeah. It, it's like a gift that keeps on giving. Like, like, funny enough, I was in another excavation I'm doing in Spain, and then suddenly the news went crazy. I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? Because Atapuerca keeps showing all these fossils. It was like, is this something new or is not? And it was, oh, it's new. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. And it was like five minutes of going, wow, this is big. And this is going to change a lot of the history of what we know about human migrations out of Africa. How did humans manage to live from Africa? What routes they have? Did they follow what is now like Near East or Middle East? Or did they go through the Gibraltar Strait? How they did it? It also show us how diverse human species were at the time. Yeah, I love her excitement there. And I love that, you know, such a small fragment of bone can tell such a big, expansive story about our history and what, who we are. It's really cool. Yeah, 10 centimeters. Incredible. And, and I have one more clip because she was just so... She said it so beautifully about how much our understanding of our past like has changed since she was in school and continues to change. I think it opens this idea of we need to be really conscious of the diversity of, of fossils back on the day. I remember when I studied history at the school and those things, there was like this tree of life 
and that was it. And there were a few species around. If you compare that in the last 10 years, 15 years, that tree has become a forest. Like the amount of branches, the amount of new species that are appearing and where they fall. And this, this new discovery adds to this, but it also adds in a really interesting time that was before we know that Neanderthals diverged or separated from a common ancestor that we still don't know what it is. We know it's before Denisovans. We know it's before modern humans. So it's always this idea of, is this the missing link? Are we finding those missing pieces that people have been looking for for so long? I love that that characterization of this, like, kind of tree of evolution becoming a forest. It's just, it's a captivating image. I agree. And I think that's why, like, we have the best subject for our podcast. Because <laughs> there's always something exciting to learn. And it's really cool. Yeah. And she says that it shows us how diverse the human species was at that time. Get asked this question, like, what happened at one point for there only to be one species of Homo sapiens that survived when for much of our history, there were many, many species all living at the same time. Yeah, and I think that story is, becomes revealed with every new fossil. The more that we learn, the more we learn how many different species were living together at the same time. Now we're all alone. <laughs> As far as we know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So on to the next one. What is the next discovery that you've brought to us, Meredith? The next story is brought to us by Kevin Hatala. Kevin teaches evolutionary biology at Chatham University, and his research focuses on the evolution of human anatomy and locomotion. A lot of Kevin's work is on fossil footprints, mainly in Africa, and his favorite discovery of 2022 is not about footprints at all. So when I looked back at discoveries from the past year, one that had me very excited was a paper that came out in Nature titled Genetic Insights into the Social Organization of Neanderthals. This study was looking at Neanderthals in two different cave sites in the Altai Mountains in Siberia between 59,000 and 44,000 years ago and the researchers were able to create a detailed portrait of an isolated community that lived about as far east as Neanderthals are known to have lived. And they did it by extracting ancient DNA from fossils of 13 individual Neanderthals, two from a cave called Okladnikov Cave, and 11 from a cave called Chagorskaya. Here's Kevin. Now, before this paper, we knew of genetic data from a total of 18 Neanderthals. And so this additional sampling of 13 more individuals nearly doubles the sample size um, of genetic data that we have available from this, from this fossil species. Once the team analyzed these genetic data, they found that among those samples, among the samples from Chagorskaya Cave, were a father-daughter pair. Um, two or three adult males who may have shared a grandmother, and a possible aunt-nephew or grandmother-grandchild pair, another pair of second-degree relatives. So just a fascinating assemblage of genetic data here. What do you think of that? I love any study that furthers the humanization of Neanderthals. Absolutely. This gives this snapshot, kind of like footprints do, of these individuals together as a community in a certain place in a certain time. Because the data suggests that these individuals could have lived at the same time and belong to the same community, which is fascinating. And it gives us, for the first time, an idea of what a community group might have been like for Neanderthals. How many people lived together? How were they related? Um, and that's a really big and important question that really helps us understand what life might have been like for Neanderthals in the past. That's really, really fascinating. Yeah, so I was really surprised and happy that Kevin brought this story. And so I asked him why this one, why was this so exciting to someone who studies fossil footprints? This paper is just such a good example that highlights the multidisciplinarity 
of paleoanthropology. And so here we have a paper where if we had to classify it as something, it's a genetics paper. Uh, but it's a genetics paper that then gives us insights to hypotheses about the evolution of human behavior. I guess this is totally disconnected from <laughs> from what I do, but you know, to me, it, it just really did jump out as something that's relevant to people across all sorts of different areas, and a really interesting paper that kind of wove together those different stories very nicely. And so they describe archaeological evidence in here too, and some of the other signals and evidence for social behavior that we've had in other parts of the fossil record. And I thought they did a, a very nice job of weaving that together with their own genetic findings here. Then I asked Kevin what this discovery adds to the bigger picture understanding of our evolution. Right. So I guess the benefits of the resolution that you get from a site like this and a type of data like this comes with some trade-offs. And so in this paper, we're looking at one place and one time. We've got we've got a limited, limited breadth to the, the window that we're getting. And so there's the potential that Neanderthal social behavior is varied across space, across time. Um, they were around for several hundred thousand years. Um, had a wide geographic range too. So it's very possible that if you found these exact same data from a different time and place that you might see a very different picture that's possible. So, so the conclusions of this paper, it's not necessarily telling us something where we can say, you know, this answers all the questions we ever had about the social behavior of Neanderthals. Um, but you're, you're never going to have that that kind of data where you can answer a question that broad. Instead, this evidence here, I think it gives us a rare opportunity, like some fossil footprint sites do, uh, where we have the, the necessary resolution where you can directly test a behavioral hypothesis in a specific time and place in the fossil record. Um, and so now we have methods developed that allow us to do this. And others can keep testing and refining these hypotheses that are laid out in this paper in new locations at different time periods, and probably even using different kinds of data, too. Wow. <gasps> yeah, I was very excited that he brought that paper because it is a story that you can really attach to and imagine the people living there in the Altai Mountains, you know, together as families. So. This idea that these people were selecting to be together in this harsh environment and living and dying together over generations tells a story. Yeah, and I love also that they're seeing this new window, you know, to these people's lives just from some powder that they took from their teeth. That kind of mm. thing just always blows my mind. The creativity in science, trying to get at this very complicated, difficult problem of understanding the human past. Not to be a spoiler, because you know this is coming, but later this year, we have a story about teeth yes. and about a scientist who says that there's nothing better than teeth. Yep. So <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> okay, so from teeth, where do we go next? <laughs> well, uh, this is a funny connection uh, from teeth to poop. Oh, okay. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> you know, from uh, tail to top. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this next discovery comes from Megan Henriquez. She's a PhD candidate at the Graduate Center at CUNY, the City University of New York. And in her own work, she studies how capuchin monkeys spread parasitic worms to each other. And she does this by looking at poop under a microscope. But even under a microscope, these tiny worms look alike. So researchers also use molecular identification to distinguish the parasites by DNA. If I'm being totally honest, a lot of the worms are really hard to distinguish and a lot of the eggs are really hard to distinguish. Yeah, I don't, I don't know too much about, about uh, the world of intestinal parasites. <laughs> it's fascinating. It is a fascinating and gross world. <laughs> I bet. So do you want to tell us about the discovery that you have brought to us today? So as a person who studies, you know, population genetics and the genetics of parasites in general, and especially in non-human primates, I am really excited whenever a paper comes out 
that looks at the sort of population structure of the taxa that I'm interested in. So I recently, very recently, just found a article that came out that looked at the population genetics of a parasite called Strongyloides fulborni, which is a threadworm that infects non-human primates throughout you know, Asia and Africa. It's an important parasite to study because there are other Strongyloides species that infect humans as well and are actually one of the sort of leading species driving the you know world health organization's interest in looking at this type of neglected tropical disease so i found this paper really interesting because they collected fecal samples from a number of primates throughout asia they were able to get out you know Uh, really important genetic markers from the parasites they isolated from these samples. And then they compared it to a larger database of sequences that already existed for the species and found really specific like genetic clustering of these different parasites collected from different localities throughout Asia. Are you following? Do you have any questions? Yeah. So if I get this right, what she's saying is that these scientists collect poop from primates in Asia and they isolated a specific worm and then they sequenced its DNA and then they put that in a big database that other scientists could share so they can understand it too. Is that correct? Yeah. And it's a really comprehensive data set too. It's really interesting that, you know, parasitologists um, in general have created these like vast networks and databases that we can all use and all reference. And I feel like it's one of the most concerted efforts to get a really nice, well-integrated sort of global database for this kind of information. So when you come across a study like this, what excites you the most? So for me, basically studies that continue to build this global database of parasite diversity in non-human primates are really fascinating because I find it so important for us to build these reference databases so that it helps sort of guide our own studies, but it also helps us understand the evolutionary history of these parasites. Because, you know, we've had them for millennia at this point. And in a way, studying the population genetics and the evolutionary history of these parasites can give us insights into our own evolutionary history as well and the evolutionary history of other non-human primates. Could you look at parasites that affect us and affect non-human primates and infer when the interaction first began or like like do parasites show up in the fossil record? Yeah, I mean they they do show up in the fossil record. They're not super prevalent and it's really hard to number one, identify them, and then also, you know, get DNA out of them, especially if we're going really far back. But just looking at the genetic signatures of parasites that humans have and that non-human primates have, we can sort of, you know, extrapolate and go back through evolutionary time and see at what point we shared a common parasitic ancestor and at what point those parasites may have diverged and if there have been any instances of crossing over since then. So, you know, looking at the genetic differences between this parasite when it's found in Asia and this parasite when it's found in Africa can tell us about, you know, when that split initially happened and why we find humans infected with this parasite only in certain regions of the world. That's so cool. It's really interesting. It, it, it has practical applications right now, like in the moment. How do we control and like mitigate and maybe even eventually eradicate this important set of diseases? And then what can, I, what can this tell us about our evolutionary relationship with these parasites that we've had for like forever? since we've existed probably. And also these large databases help us, you know, mitigate future risks, but they also help understand our evolutionary history as well. If we look at the patterns of differentiation and speciation um, in these parasites themselves, they can tell us a little bit about 
the evolutionary history of their hosts as well, right? We've been co-evolving together for hundreds of thousands of years. And so there's some degree of host evolutionary history reflected in parasitic evolutionary history as well. So studying how these parasites are related to each other tells us a little bit about, you know, crossover events between different host species. So I think it all helps to build this sort of cohesive and well-rounded picture of our own evolutionary history. What will this make possible that wasn't possible before? Ooh. So I think this will make our sort of parasite management plans more effective than they've ever been. Because for a long time, the leading sort of strategy theory behind parasite transmission in these communities was that it was a blanket effect, right? But in recent decades, with, you know, more intensive sampling, and now using these more innovative uh, genetic methods for identifying different strains and, and subtypes of parasites, we see that parasite transmission within even small scale communities is really heterogeneous. Like it's not, it's not just, you know, one person has it, everyone has it, there are, you know, transmission hotspots. So being able to sort of map transmission both genetically and you know geographically on the small scale and then extrapolating that to the large scale will help us create management plans that are more effective and you know less wasteful and hopefully less detrimental in general to the population I don't think about parasites but I do think about How they might affect us. (laughs) (laughs) How much you don't want them. And so, yeah, she says that this this should and it will like change the ways that we craft parasite management plans and it, it will change the theory around using like a blanket effect drugs versus specific solutions for specific problems because this like genetic sampling of parasites in primates will also be used in humans. Yeah, I can see how that would lead to really targeted medicines that would help a lot of people. Yeah, hopefully a lot of good will come out of this study. But I think I think more so than anything, more studies will come out of this study. <laughs> yeah, because it seems really promising. Yeah, there are really exciting things around the corner in this field of research and in her research. So I, I can't wait to see what she brings us next. Excellent. So that's it for our short tour of some of the most exciting human origins research of the past year. And like I said at the beginning of the episode, we're just so happy to be back to bring you a new season of stories and interviews exploring what it means to be human. Many thanks to our guests, Carol Ward, Sophia Sampercaro, Kevin Hatala, and Megan Henriquez. Thanks also to Ivo Jacobs. In 2023, origin stories will come out on the last Tuesday of every month. Next month, we're taking a look at the most essential building blocks of our lives, calories, and the new science of human energetics with Dr. Herman Ponser. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to advancing human origins research and sharing discoveries. Do you want to support this show and the science we talk about? Leakey Foundation President Jeannie Newman is matching up to $5,000 in donations from Origin Stories listeners. Double your impact and make a donation at leakyfoundation.org slash originstories23 or use the link in your show notes. In February, join the Leaky Foundation for two special online programs, Where's the Love? The Secrets of Chimpanzee Relationships on February 8th, 2023 and Lunch Break Science with Tom Plummer on February 16th. He'll be sharing some hot off the presses brand new research. Details are in your show notes. This episode was generously sponsored by Diana McSherry and Pat Poe. Origin Stories is also sponsored by Jeannie Newman, the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund. Thanks as well to the Benevity Community Impact Fund for their support of the show.
This episode was produced by Ray Pang. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Our theme music is by Henry Nagel. Additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Lee Rosevere. And I'm Meredith Johnson. Thanks for listening. <laughs>